Good evening, everyone. My name is Alex Wallace, and I'm a paediatrician currently undertaking a PhD at the Liggins Institute. I'm very pleased to talk to you today about the Fetal Anemia Study, a project we've undertaken to investigate the influence of fetal anemia on cardiovascular health in later life. To begin, I'd like to tell you a story about a remarkable New Zealander by the name of William Lyley. I suspect few of you have heard of Lyley. However, in the early 1960s, while working at National Women's Hospital here in Auckland, Lyley made a revolutionary medical breakthrough when he pioneered the technique of intrauterine blood transfusion for fetuses afflicted by rhesus hemolytic disease. In so doing, Lyley became the very first person in the world to deliver treatment specifically to an unborn baby, an achievement that led him to become known as the father of perinatal medicine. Lyley's technique soon became the accepted standard of care for fetuses with severe rhesus disease, saving the lives of thousands of babies throughout the world. So what is rhesus hemolytic disease? Well, rhesus disease occurs when a rhesus-negative mother develops antibodies against the red blood cells of her rhesus-positive fetus. Her first baby is usually not affected. However, in subsequent pregnancies, these antibodies can cross the placenta and destroy the red blood cells of her fetus. This can make her fetus severely anemic, meaning that the red blood cell count drops to dangerously low levels. In the 1940s and 50s, Rhesus disease was an enormous problem. 50% of affected babies died either before birth or soon after, and 10% of all neonatal deaths were due to rhesus disease. No treatment was available prior to birth. However, thanks to Lyley, a new era of rhesus disease emerged in the 1960s. With intrauterine blood transfusion, fetal anemia was treatable and severely affected babies could be kept alive in the womb long enough to achieve a viable gestational age. Concomitant improvements in both obstetric and neonatal practice contributed to the reduction in mortality from rhesus disease. The culmination of these advances was the generation of a cohort of babies who were the survivors of severe rhesus disease. But would the difficulties these babies had experienced in their stormy start to life have any influence on their health as adults? Which brings us to the topic of the developmental origins of adult disease. An association between an adverse intrauterine environment and chronic disease was first proposed in the 1980s by David Barker, following extensive epidemiological studies. A plethora of literature now exists to support the fact that the intrauterine environment plays an important role in determining the risk of disease in later life, especially cardiovascular disease. Most work to date has focused on the role of unfavorable fetal nutrition, but could fetal anemia also influence cardiovascular health in later life? So what do we already know about the effect of fetal anemia? Well, we know that it is a complex physiological stressor which reduces oxygen supply to the fetus and causes changes to regional blood flow, which are most marked in the coronary blood vessels, the arteries which supply blood to the heart muscle. In fact, a six-fold increase in coronary blood flow has been shown to occur in anemic fetal sheep, compared to, at most, a two-fold increase in blood flow to other parts of the body. This suggests that the coronary circulation is more susceptible to the effects of fetal anemia. Very importantly, changes to the coronary blood vessels have also been found in adult sheep who were exposed to anemia prior to birth. Whether similar changes occur in humans who were anemic before birth is not known. Thus, the aim of this study is to compare the health of adults who suffered fetal anemia with, an, with that of an unaffected sibling with respect to cardiac function, coronary blood flow, and cardiovascular risk factors. The so-called affected participants in this study were therefore adults who suffered fetal anemia due to rhesus disease and received intrauterine blood transfusion at National Women's Hospital between 1963 and 1992. And the, effect, the unaffected uh, group were siblings of the affected participants. Our recruitment target was 80 sibling pairs. Cardiac function was assessed using cardiac MRI scans. 
cardiovascular risk factors, heart rate variability, and basic hematological and biochemical parameters were also assessed. In total, 473 fetuses received intrauterine transfusion within the prescribed time frame. Of these, 242 survived the perinatal period and 228 were believed to be alive at the time of the study. We successfully traced and contacted nearly 90% of these individuals. 36 were unable to participate and a further 56 had no unaffected sibling. 95 of the remaining 107 agreed to participate, resulting in follow-up of 89% of potential index cases. Investigations are now complete on all 95 affected participants plus 92 unaffected siblings, equating to 88 sibling groups and thus exceeding our original recruitment target. So what did we find? Well, in terms of baseline characteristics, there were no differences between groups for sex distribution. However, as rhesus disease is uncommon in the firstborn in a family, unaffected participants were older than their affected siblings. In addition, affected participants were born at an earlier gestation and of lower birth weight due to their difficulties in utero. In the graphs that follow, affected participants are represented by the red columns and unaffected siblings by the green columns. Volumes for the main pumping chamber of the heart, the left ventricle, are presented here, and these really are very interesting findings. As you can see, all three of the main measures of heart volume are decreased in affected participants. These findings suggest that affected participants also have reduced cardiac output, the amount of blood pumped out by the heart every minute. Affected participants also had a trend towards reduced left ventricular mass index, which is a measure of heart mass normalised for body size. With regard to cardiovascular risk factors, affected participants had an 8% reduction in the concentration of high-density lipoprotein, the so-called good cholesterol, which helps to protect against the development of cardiovascular disease. We also assessed heart rate variability, which is a non-invasive measure of the neurological control of the heart. The increase in the LF, or low frequency, to HF, high frequency ratio, found in affected participants indicates increased sympathetic nervous system activity, which is in turn suggestive of increased cardiovascular risk. We found no differences between the groups for any other cardiovascular risk factors or outcomes, although as yet we have no data for coronary flow. These findings are expected by the end of this year and are eagerly awaited given that the available animal data indicates that this is where significant differences between groups may lie. So what can we infer from this work? Well, these findings suggest to us that heart growth is impaired by fetal anemia, resulting in smaller cardiac chambers in adulthood. A relatively smaller heart implies a reduction in cardiac cell number and therefore greater work per unit of heart muscle which may well be a disadvantage, particularly under conditions of stress. In addition, decreased high-density lipoprotein and increased sympathetic activity also imply increased cardiovascular risk. To conclude, these exciting findings provide us with the very first evidence in humans that fetal anemia may have deleterious cardiovascular consequences in adulthood. As rhesus disease is now largely preventable, the question that follows from this work is whether there are cardiovascular consequences for adults who were born early and exposed to anemia while still preterm, a question we are currently investigating with a study in preterm sheep. Taken together, the findings of both these studies will not only have implications for the adult survivors of fetal anemia, but may also influence transfusion thresholds for both the fetus and the preterm neonate. It is outstanding that here at the University of Auckland we've had the opportunity to continue Lyle's legacy with this work. If he was alive today, I know he would be excited by this new knowledge and the impact it may have on the health of future generations. I'd just like to acknowledge all the participants of this study who were so enthusiastic about taking part um, and without whom clearly we could not have done this work. 
I'd also like to acknowledge my fantastic supervisors, Jane Harding and Stuart Dalziel, our collaborator in the States, Kent Thornburg, and our funders, the Health Research Council and the Lottery Grant Board. Thank you. Thank you.